Hello, assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome to another episode of The Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Diaz. Uh, as I always say, it's a pleasure to you know be here at this time in the week where we have the chance to talk about such fantastic things. Soul food is what I say. You know, the whole week when you're going through so many things mechanically and you know, fast-paced life, this is a time when you can slow down. You can enjoy those classics, enjoy art, literature, music, dance, all those wonderful things that keep us going, keep our souls refreshed. Today, we're going to talk about a very famous novel, and what we're going to talk about, the title of the novel novel is The Count of Monte Cristo and um, The Count of Monte Cristo was written by Alexandre Dumas. He was a very very famous French writer and uh, widely acclaimed and this book was the one that was most widely recognized. He also wrote a couple of more books as well. To talk about today's novel, to talk about the, you know, the theme, the plot, why it's a classic. We have with us today in the studios, Mr. Fahim Sardar, who is an author, corporate executive, and trainer. Thank you very much, Fahim Sam, for joining us here Thank today. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> and I must say, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure yes, as, you, you know, that the, the shows that we've had before as well have also, you know, had very good feedback. So that's, I think that's fantastic. <laughs> it's wonderful having you on again. It's nice to know, nice to know. Right, okay, so, you know, when we talk about this particular novel, The Count of Mount Cristo, and what it represents, what the plot is, what the author is trying to say. Sure. It, it's hard to go you know, into detail, but in a broad overview, what, what's actually going on in this novel? Um, uh, it, to, be very, to be fair, it's a bit of an epic, mm. and I mean, uh, it, it, it is a long story, but it is a story of determination, human nature, revenge, and a little bit about love. Mm. It is wrongly assumed to be a story of love, which mm. it is. Mm. Well, I mean, there is love and passion in mm. it, but uh, one of the predominant features of this story is planning and revenge. Mm. How a man, a sailor, mm. is wrongfully imprisoned by a group of ambitious men who had issues with him, mm. jealous issues mm. or um, work issues or love issues. Mm. He's wrongly imprisoned in a, in a prison where he was supposed to die. Mm. And after 14 years, with the, the friend of an, after having befriended another prisoner, mm. he alone escapes from that prison. And he's after spending 14 years. 14 years. Okay. And after contemplating suicide mm. in a sixth year of solitude. Mm. These are solitary uh, the, confinements. The, the, exactly. These are solitary confinements where the person is supposed to go mad. Mm. They're poli basically political prisoners. Mm. And after 14 years, he, he escapes, and then he comes back as the Count of Monte Cristo. Mm. And he exacts revenge on all the people who destroyed his life. Mm. And step by step, he destroys their lives. Mm. But uh, at the same time, he's also helping those people exactly. who have helped him. Exactly. I was just about to say mm. that. That I mean, on he's very clear. He's very black and white about things mm. now, because we see two different people here. If we take away the titles, that this is a count, this is the the, the main character Edmund Dante. That mm. initially he's 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 a little naive. You know, he's he's, he's like a child, mm. a, a strong child who's a sailor, who's a good swimmer, who's mm. this, who's working hard. But then something terrible happens, and all of his life comes crumbling down, and his mind is destroyed and, and with the help of another man, mm. his mind is rebuilt, his right. personality is rebuilt. Right. And when he comes out, he's not that child anymore. Mm. He's totally changed, he's very calculating, he's very methodical. He, as you very rightly said, he, he helps the people who had helped him, mm. who, were on, uh, who were trying to be good to him. Mm. He hasn't forgotten that and he's certainly not forgotten the people who destroyed his life. Mm. So it's, it's a collection of all these things. I mean, there are lots of opposites happening at the same time. Mm. Uh, lots of uh, uh, human inter uh, emotions happening at mm. the same time, but beautifully interplayed by mm. uh, the author Alexandre Dumas, who's mm. one of the most famous French authors, right. who was uh, of mixed race, by the way. Right. We will d discuss the author as well in Absolutely. detail and how he comes through <laughs> into sure. his characters. Okay, so you know, as you said, there's a lot of transformation and transition yeah. in this in this novel concerning the human nature the human mind how it works how we react and how we build our relationships and our lives 
in reaction to what we are perceiving around us. It's also it's also sort of a, a tragedy in a way that you know uh, at the time that he is imprisoned, and that is that wake up call for him. That's his sort of as you said he was very naive. That's his end of innocence at that time, exactly. isn't it? For him to open his eyes and say, okay, this, this is the real world. Yes. This is what happens. Crimes of passion. Crimes of passion play a, a huge part as well in this. Exactly. And um, uh, it's, it's that passion which he... Um, uh, I just have to go back two steps, and I would just like to add to what you just said. There is a change in human nature and the human mind, but there is a great element of... Uh, monolithicism as I call it the, the mind on the face of it has changed but at the end of the book you realize no he had not forgotten who he was mm. he at the end of the book you mm. realize there is that innocence in him still there mm. and he's but he's the thing is he's not very clear what's wrong what's right what mm. he wants to do how he wants to do it mm. crimes of fashion are obviously um, at the forefront of many things but one thing which I I, I, I couldn't I just couldn't let go when I was going through the whole story because this is this is a childhood favorite story of mine mm. and you know having read the unabridged version 20 years ago th this book is 20 years yes, ago yes yes you, you were telling and us that's <laughs> very interesting 20 <laughs> years to that book and it's almost, now almost the same now it's being discussed in a television show I so know, honestly, imagine, I never thought about that imagine that if you'd known that 20 years ago exactly okay. so so one thing that does not escape the reader is the fact that um, how in his time of imprisonment in those 14 years that aside from the things that he learns because people might not be familiar with the story mm. the other prisoner teaches him philosophy mathematics mm. politics mm. and sociology mm. and economics and things like that but one thing that the prisoner his the elder prisoner called Faria teaches him mm. is patience be patient and control your impulse because in the story we, we learn that Edmund Dante is actually a very strong leith young man mm. and he is able to do many things even as a sailor that's why people despise him you know he's too mm. good mm. but when he's imprisoned and he befriends the other prisoner who was trying to escape him who accidentally gets into his cell mm. he gradually learns that you have to control your impulse mm. and, and this is something so important that we, we uh, uh, nowadays it's called impulse control mm. now it's called a a disease as well. People cannot control their impulses. Mm. Here you see that man, the man controls his passions, his impulses, mm. and when he comes out of prison, he is, he's, he's honed, he's sharpened, he's annealed mm. in a manner that he can, he can call his passions to his will, not the other way around. And he's also become emotionally intelligent much more intelligent which He's is sort of ironic exactly uh, that you know when we see in in uh, today's uh, um, times as well you will see that the person with a higher intelligence qu intelligence quotient may be less successful than a person with a higher emotional quotient that's true because they are able to deal with different situations as you mentioned impulse and be able to control a situation and not always be in the reactionary phase absolutely. because that many of us are in the reactionary phase without even absolutely realizing we, uh, and just adding to what you're saying i mean I, I i call it and i've even described that this what you just said in one of my books it's it's the animalistic nature you become more animalistic you just react you don't think mm. one of the most dangerous animals on earth they say is the hippopotamus because he just Which you reacts. wouldn't think so you wouldn't think so but something that is even more dangerous than hippopotamus is actually the leopard because the leopard thinks you can't train a leopard mm. you can train a lion you can't train a leopard so coming back to here you you see the animalistic nature mm. uh, slowly slowly coming under control to right. a point to a point that Edmund Dante he knows um, uh, he knows that his friend elder friend is dying from pleurisy mm. and he doesn't want him to die mm. what happens in the scene is and just for the benefit of our viewers who don't know the story long mm. story short Edmund Dante is a sailor who on his wedding day is arrested by people who who have betrayed who, him who accuse him of mm. being a Bonapartist mm. so and that, that at that time we realize that Napoleon was out of power. Mm. He was exiled to Elba. Mm. And you know, long story short, he's sent to Chateau Dieff, where for six years, 
he is kept in silence mm -hmm. and he's going crazy. He's mm -hmm. listening to the insects and everything. Then he starts hearing scratching sounds. Then he thinks he's going crazy. Mm -hmm. and just when he's about to commit suicide, mm -hmm. he realizes that something is in his room. Mm -hmm. Something just comes into his room from the rock and mm -hmm. he thinks it's a ghost. It's a white mm -hmm haired man mm. with a long beard and turns out to be another prisoner who was trying to escape. Right they befriend each family, other yeah. and Faria, his name is Faria, mm. teaches him all these things and he teaches him how to be a good man. But above all, which we need to emphasize here, is he goes through Edmund's case. Mm. He asks him all the specifics, what exactly happened. Okay. Then he's the one who tells him, this is what happened to you. Mm. So uh, in the seventh or eighth year, he finds out what mm. actually happened to him. Mm. And slowly he builds himself up. But uh, what we see is an impulsive young man mm. who becomes a very controlled person. Mm. And we also see in the story that when he enters Parisian society again as a, mm. as, as you know, uh, a man with wealth and, you know, people are just bedazzled mm. by his wealth mm. and everything. There's only one point where his heart gives way. Mm. It's when he meets Mercedes again. Yeah. And he's, he's a total stone cold mm. man calculating all the time. But when he meets Mercedes again, mm. his heart gives way. And it is his... That's his weak moment. That's his just one moment of weakness. And right. he turns away. I remember in the story, he turns away and does something just to collect himself. Mm. And that's the only moment where we see that old to a couple coming back together where she is the only one in who the whole story him. who recognizes him. Right. So... Uh, which brings me to this to this point that I wanted to make that when we as humans when we start to control our impulse we are not only change our nature but I think we change our appearance as well mm -hmm. that's very interesting it, it changes how we are and people uh, may think of you as a new person as a different mm. person obviously it's more um, uh, uh, strongly put in the mm. story because mm. you've got wealth and all these things yeah. so um, just uh, continuing with the, the just to give a, for the benefit of the viewers, if you, if you permit me for a mm. minute, that when Faria is teaching Edmund all these things, mm. he also tells him about a certain treasure. Now, this is the funny part because every time, uh, now they have a tunnel between the two cells. Mm. So they inter they're interacting with each other when the guards are not there. Mm. So Edmund would hear Faria telling the guards that, set me free, I'll give you lots of treasure. Mm. And the guards are, okay, this old priest is mad. Mm. Anyhow, he, he gives a map to Edmund mm. that this is a map mm. of the treasure. It's on an island called Monte Cristo. Mm. The, th there's a lot of treasure. You go get it when I die. Mm. So anyhow, long story short, um, w when Edmund escapes from prison mm. through the death of Faria, mm. by hiding himself in the death shroud of Faria, mm. they throw him in the sea. Mm. He doesn't know that he's about to be thrown into the sea. He this, thinks he's going to be buried. Yes, exactly. And he's mm. ready to, uh, escape, to from the earth. escape from the earth. Mm. But this is a very critical point, at least in my eyes, that mm. you, you have the element of water mm. coming back into his life. Symbolic. It's a form of rebirth because mm. he literally he comes out of this womb. Yeah. And then he escapes. And there's a scene which I have to describe which, uh, which highlights the impulse point. Mm. When he uh, swims to uh, somewhere and, and th a smuggling ship, they pick him up. There, who's this guy with this long beard? And mm. and suddenly there's this noise that an, uh, uh, a convict has escaped mm. from Chateau d'If. And very calmly they look at him because he's got this long beard that you must be the convict. And very calmly he picks up, he's drinking something and he's just totally in control of his emotions. Mm. Although inside he knew it was him, mm, mm. but he would be given away yeah. if he reacted. So very calmly there's a scene that he just drinks and he says, I don't know who they're talking about. Mm. And they're like, oh, it's not him then, someone else. So the whole concept was, the whole situation was depending on a human reaction, which very he controlled. True. That is further elaborated when he goes down and he shaves. Mm. Now, this is another critical, I think, I felt it was a critical point. Mm. When he shaves and he sees his face after 14 years, mm. and he looks at his eyes, and his eyes have gone deep set. His cheekbones have grown a little bit more. His jawline has become more pronounced. His cheeks have gone in. And, and he's looking at himself after how many years? 14 years. 14 years. And he's, he could not recognize himself, and he, he knew that's him. Mm. Because and then that's symbolic as well, isn't it? Because he's not just looking at his outer self, he's looking at his inner self as well. That's precisely what I was trying to mm. come towards, and thank you for that. Uh, in the sense that uh, this book is about um, 
how we also have a mask on our face yeah. and people don't look inside yeah. and those who do look inside they see much better much more mm. much worse mm. but that's the real life because uh, now when he comes he goes and gets the treasure and then he suddenly becomes rich and mm. all of his earlier friends have now suddenly start getting lucky all of a sudden mm. his previous employer Mr. Morel mm. he's about to lose his business because he has shipping mm. debts mm. suddenly and, and suddenly out of the blue those debts disappear somebody just bought those debts mm. but uh, taking two steps back we have to go uh, to where this revenge starts from mm. uh, it, there's a scene in the book where um, after the escape there's quiet Mm. Then suddenly a man appears after some time. Mm. He goes to Chateau Dieu, mm. properly dressed as a gentleman, mm. and he bribes the guards, bribes the warden. He says, I want to see the prison file, mm. prisoner file. Mm. And th he gives them a lot of money so they, don't, they stay out of his way. And he finds his name and he tears the page. So he erases certain things of his past. Okay. And that's where the thing starts. And suddenly what we have to understand is this book is not about just you know determination mm. it is about planning very yeah. careful planning in the meantime he builds up assets of people mm. and he starts getting information about the people who used to be in his life mm. 14 15 16 years ago mm. he enters Parisian society which is uh, it's it's uh, it's slightly debauched it's it's uh, that uh, they just believe in money mm. money is an end for them superficial ostentatious. For him, he's, he's now wealthy, money's not an end, it's mm. just a tool. So mm. what he does is he uses their weaknesses. Mm. Against them. Against them. Right. And uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that you see a reflection of, now this is live society. Mm. First he was alone for 14 years, now you see all of a sudden all these people in the book. And now he's not taken in. He now just he care. is able to understand and, and look at people without being involved with them and clearly observe them exactly what's and, going on. And adding to what you're saying, he the the most uh, I felt what, which was very interesting was he he could act the part, and he, mm. he was he was just acting. Right. He would just act as if he's a very you know he's a nobleman and he's mm. very much into wealth and uh, mm. although when you read the whole book you realize he used to live very simply. Mm. He used to eat very simply. He this was all just an act, mm. so that people are drawn in, mm. and all the people who helped him, mm. they just can't explain. They're, they're, they're also suddenly so lucky. Yeah, the problems is are going out away. For them. Somebody they just saw a shadow. There yeah. was a guy. Somebody helped them, mm. and stuff like that. But the people who are evil, they don't get that suddenly things are going wrong, mm. because he uses their information against them. Right. So. Uh, as I was sharing with you just before uh, we started that when I when I was a child and I read the Count of Monte Cristo I read the abridged version which was not you know I mean it's, it's just a it's an easy part that was just one less than one third of the book mm. so it's not just about escaping it's mm. about de being determined it's about claiming back what's yours right absolutely I mean you know th the author here has you know created a character who is showing us what empowerment really is. Yes, that's true. And the empowerment really, uh, for a person to be successful, you know, you would say that a person who is in fully control of, himself. of themselves, given any situation, because, I mean, on a good day, when things are working in your favor, we'll all be in a good <laughs> mood and we'll all be, you know, wonderful to people to work Absolutely. with. Absolutely. And not just work, you know, this is at home in relationships. With I think the most important relationship that we ignore is the relationship with ourselves. That's true. And again, the author has, you know, he's highlighted that. The solitary confinement, you know, imagine just for a minute, the solitary confinement to be such a major punishment world over. What does that mean? Absolutely, and um, uh, <laughs> if you cannot manage your own mind, uh, there's a comedian I just recently uh, I was, was listening to. It was really funny. He, he said while running his uh, his uh, iPhone or whatever his iPod sort of mm. got disabled, and then suddenly he says, you know, it's on a lighter note. He says, "My God, feelings are scary." 
<laughs> feelings and thoughts are scary. Right. So I, all the time I thought I had a, a nice sense of music, but actually I am, I'm scared of my feelings. Yeah. So when you're alone, yeah. these things you have to deal with. Exactly. And um, it, is, it is very important to point out that in the Count of Monte Cristo, you realize when he's incarcerated, mm. it's his mind that's being strengthened. Mm. What you said about, you know, uh, about, about being stronger. Mm. Now, that strength comes from the mind. Mm. It doesn't come from being rich. Mm. That's, I mean, it is so clear in the book. You can tell every time you see his wealth being displayed, you, you get the feeling it's just a tool. Mm. He's using that as a tool. That's not the end. Mm. Whereas the people he's interacting with, Mm. They all consider that to be the end of life. Mm. Make more money, get more houses, do mm. this, do that. And at the end of the book, you realize uh, he just doesn't care about that money. He cares about peace. He wants mm. peace. He wanted closure. Mm. God has closure. And then he sails away into the, literally sails away into the sunset. Mm. Now, what's important is if you look at the crest mm. of that in the book, you have a crest that the Count of Monte Cristo has a crest. Mm. It has two words. Mm. Uh, in French, of course, I, I mean, uh, it says wait mm. and hope. Yeah. Wait and hope. And right. that's what the, the book ends with, these words, wait mm. and hope. Mm. And that is, you know, again, a huge message because um, when you are reading a, a classic like that, uh, the feeling, as you said, you read it 20 years ago. Yep. And here you are discussing it again today yep. with the same passion, with the same involvement. I because it yeah, stayed with it's you. It's still there. You <laughs> see, it's, it's spoken to you. And, and it, it must have, um, you know, other readers as well, it must have impacted their lives in so many ways. So we're talking about empowering the mind. The mind is the ruler of, you know, whatever is going to happen. As you said, that classic scene where his life literally depended on his reaction. Exactly. For his reaction to have given him away or to, you know, Absolutely. Uh, to protect him. And isn't that what we're usually doing in real life? Don't we usually shift the blame too often to other people and say, well, look, he or she behaved like this. So this was bound to happen. Do we think of the other outcome? But okay, if they did what they did and we reacted in a different way, <laughs> what would have been the story? That's true, and I think you're being very kind. I think we, we do this more often than we would care to admit. Mm. We just like to blame the other person. Yeah. And, and um, uh, uh, this book inspired Stephen King mm. to write the, write the novel The Shawshank Redemption, mm. which became a famous movie and everything. And in that movie, when, when you see all these prisoners in mm. an American prison, mm. they get these books from the library, and there's this guy, his, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the lead character in that, in mm. that story, Dufresne. Mm. Dufresne get, picks, uh, he's dealing with these books, and his colleague, a, a grunt, mm. he picks up this book and he says, Alexandre Damas, mm. the Count of, what's this? Mm. So he says, it's the Count of Monte Cristo, and it's Alexandre Dumas. Mm. And you'll like the story because it's about a prison escape. Mm -hmm. So uh, we see how much this has inspired even the great writers of today. Um, uh, coming back to the uh, uh, synthesizing, uh, the, I, mean, I, I mean, I still I love the story mm. because of the control, mm. of his desire to control himself, not others. Yeah. You see, it Very goes, it goes point. In, exactly, it goes in the opposite direction. He's not mm. trying to control others. He's yeah. trying to control himself. Yeah. He, he, He's very careful with his words. He's mm. very careful with what he, what he does. To the extent that the revenge that he exacts, mm. he's very careful about that. Mm. He even forgives mm. one of the people after having dealt with him. He forgives mm. him. He can now go away. The other one person commits suicide. The other, he mm. forgives. And Nortier, I think, goes, uh, one of the men, the prosecutor, he goes insane when he mm. sees, this is the man I imprisoned mm. and that I've been dealing with in Paris society. Right. The blindness which I need to highlight here is um, the willful blindness of mm. human nature. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's something that, that, that's like a blind spot that we w want to have. Mm. We don't want to see certain things. Oh, that's so true. It, it, in the whole book, what you see is these people who are evil. Yeah. They're constantly brought up against this guy. All they had to do was look carefully mm. at him. Okay, you know, we've seen this guy somewhere before. Mm. And he's talking to us in our language. He's being so yeah. nice and polite and mm. suave and debonair mm. and everything. Yet 
who is this person? But mm. that never crosses their mind. Mm. So sometimes the masks yeah. <laughs> are something that suit us. On another person, quite well, we quite do well. not want to unveil <laughs> them. We want to stay with this impression that we have. And we don't actually, we're scared of the truth, aren't we? Th that word you just used, scared, you see, you, we are scared of the truth. I totally agree with you. He was also scared of the truth, but he had to face it in prison. And he, and he, he conquered it. And, and, and what did he do? He didn't become a mean person. He, mm. he became a stronger man. Mm. But there was an outside influence because mm. he, this strong man was about to kill himself mm. when, that, when that Faria appears point. from the ground. And it's very symbolic of, of rebirth. Mm. You see these opposites happening at the same time. You see, for example, he gets the light of knowledge mm. in a dark prison. Again, a yeah. prison where there isn't no light because in, in this book it's described that it gets so dark the eyes get accustomed to looking at insects in the dark. Mm. So he teaches him astronomy, mm. mathematics, philosophy, uh, diplomacy and all these things and you see a collect that he's willing to listen, he wants to learn. Mm. Initially he didn't want to learn mm. but then he learns and then he, he becomes stronger and better. He, he actually becomes a count because, uh, uh, because I, I keep have, I have to give references to the book. Mm. In throughout the book, there is only one part, one point where a person actually accosts him and says, "You I mean Monte Cristo? I mean, well, what what is that? I mean, how how are you a count of a barren mm. island it's that has only and scorpions snakes. and snakes?" Right. And he very calmly, very explains to him, "Can okay, no, it's it's where I'm from, and this and that." So uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is, he actually does become a count. Mm. He builds himself up. Mm. But at the end, you realize that he has, uh, you think he's forgotten himself mm. and he's just out for revenge. No, at the end of the book, you realize, no, he still remembers who he was. And he's found peace. He has found peace, mm. but times have changed. He's an old man now. Mm. And the one, the woman he loved, he doesn't live with her anymore. I mean, mm. she, she has her own life now. So he has a slave girl who he emancipates. Mm. And he, after he emancipates her, mm she starts to, she bre breaks down and because she knows she's going to be alone. Mm. And uh, he's about to go and then they, sh of her own free will, she chooses to live with him. Mm. And they literally sail away into the mm. sunset right. with, with hope and, and patience. I guess uh, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but the moral of the story of is to control one's mind. Yeah, not and not to be a slave to emotions. Exactly. I think that is the main message here, isn't it? Because it is, yeah. often we find we find ourselves as I know I don't know what it's got to do with demographics, <laughs> but certainly in our area of the you know you have different nations who are known for being more emotional. <laughs> more emotional. I, I, I mean, I, I would just add to what you're saying that by saying that uh, I think there's certain nations that are more descriptive, demonstrative mm. about their emotions. Yeah. Uh, it just comes out in different ways. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, but here you see, uh, oh, one more thing about this book, which it is, it is a multicultural book. Mm. I, I mean, it, it's, got, it's got people from the Mediterranean, it's got people who are Muslims, it's got Christians, it's got mm. uh, pirates. It's mm. got, I mean, it, this is a, a story which uh, keeps you, uh, you're not just in Paris. Right. And even his house, mm. his house in Paris that, that everybody's so fond of, is not just a Parisian house. Mm. It's got the Orient in it. It's got Asia in it. It's got Africa in it. Mm. It's got uh, Christian culture, Muslim mm. culture in his house. Is that one of the reasons for it being so popular even today? I, 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 I would guess so. Mm. I mean, I think the story is so unique because yeah. it's based on a, I, I think it's based on a, 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 a diary note or something which uh, the author Alexander Dumas was inspired by, mm. but uh, it's a very original story. Mm. It's it's very different yeah. because you see derivatives of this. Mm. As I said, the Shawshank Redemption, mm. written by Stephen King, which turned into a blockbuster movie, yeah. is based on this. And he even mentions this story mm. in his own story, so mm. you can see the direct connection. He's like, you know, I'm inspired by this. Mm. Um, it is something which um, uh, it cr cuts across many cultures, mm. and it ends in Western culture. So that's m not being from the West, mm. you, you sort of see that very clearly. Mm. And um, a person who is in a very opulent society mm. or seemingly opulent society, he he's willing to give it away just to be at peace with himself. That is, you know, uh, 
it's sort of like he, he travels full circle. He does. He has been to the depths, True. he's been to rock bottom, and then he's risen from there, he's become a self-made person, he's yes. mastered his emotions. And then at the time where you know he's enjoying everything and he's in that time of power, he relinquishes. Because, uh, because I, I think uh, 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 he is not interested in power. Mm. He, he, he wants power for a purpose, mm. and he uses it, the purpose has been achieved, you mm. close the chapter there. Right, which is very wise, and uh, seeing that power is yeah. so addictive. It is addictive. That is something that he consciously makes that decision. And, and uh, what you just pointed out, you see it throughout the book. I mean, you see people who are still addicted to power, oh, yeah. addicted to that mm. seemingly opulent way that, that, that uh, but but he's very clear, mm. which brings us back, you know, coming full circle, as you said. Mm. Uh, it's it's understanding human nature, and he controls his nature rather than his nature is controlling him. Which is yeah, yeah. one of the biggest messages in that book. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the author. Sure. Now, <laughs> because I think that's really really relevant. Alexander Dumas. Okay, he was um, also a person who was. Uh, he lived a very full life. <laughs> full life, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, lots going on there. Tell us about that. How much of himself has come through? I think um, uh, Alexander Dumas, as I said, was of mixed race. Mm. His, 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 I think, grandmother or his mother was uh, Santa Domingan or something. And she was, I think, a, a slave woman or something of the mm -hmm. sort. So you see that thing playing up. You see that in the end. You see that in the yeah, end. Actually, okay. it starts from the center of the book till the end, until mm. he emancipates her. Mm. Um, I think t uh, the, the, the cross-cultural nature mm. that you see in this story is, I think, it, it does come from Alexandre Dumas being himself, mm. being, being able to see what another race can see. Mm. You see? Um, unless you live with someone, mm. and unless people who have lived in Africa, they cannot understand how an African thinks. Yeah, and well, what the culture is. Exactly, if somebody's yeah. lived in the West, they can speak about how the West may think. Mm. If somebody's lived in, lived in China, mm. that's the way. Uh, William Dalrymple is, is known as a, a uh, he's in love with the subcontinent because his grandfather or great-grandfather used to work in the East India Company. Mm. So it's it's a generational thing which passes mm. on, maybe mm. genetically or maybe psychologically. Mm. But uh, Alexander Dumas, you can see there is that, uh, because when you read Victor, Victor Hugo, that's different. Mm. It's purely, uh, it's more uh, isolated, so to speak. But you can see these different cultures coming into his story. Mm. The Three Musketeers is slightly different. Mm. But <coughs> this is the most different book, at mm. least in my eyes, mm. by Alexander Dumas. Because... Um, the story is different. It, it, it cuts across so many countries. Mm. So much is happening. You see people uh, with, you can see the descriptions that he gives that of different races mm. and them coming together in a very uh, mm. perfectly chaotic way or chaotically perfect way, however that's you want to That's a very nice term. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's one of the, the biggest strengths of this book, which he may not have desired Mm. You know, I want it this way, but it just happened because it was right. natural to him. Mm. It's not something which uh, other people can synthesize so easily. Right. Okay, so, you know, we're talking a lot about <coughs> human nature as in the theme of this book, the transitions it may go through, how circumstances in life can change the person you are True. for better or for worse, depending on how you deal with these things. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we're talking about empowering the mind, where it all starts, <coughs> how much does reading have an influence on, <laughs> you know, minds of any ages? And how important is it? Uh, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's extremely important to read, to read properly. Um, uh, it's reading opens up the mind. It takes you to, uh, you see, when you read, s when you read gibberish. Mm. And when you read something systematic, there's a difference. Mm. So to say reading is the only thing, I would sort of qualify that to read something properly mm. is the appropriate way. Right. To read, uh, for example, uh, things that don't, don't really make sense mm. or they're all like uh, jumbled up, they actually affect your mind. Mm. Likewise, when you read something systematically, it mm. affects your mind. 
hmm. puts things in order. Reading is the ability to, which I, I'm talking to the youth these days in hmm. universities and so on and so forth, that reading is a way of transporting yourself into yeah. another world. Hmm. Learn from it, feel it, sense it. I mean, hmm. it's not there, but it, it, it's, it has been created there. Yeah. Get into it, learn. The first word of the Quran is Iqra, mm. read. Mm. I, I, I mean, what else can I say? Mm. I mean, to, to read is to learn. But to learn when the cup has to be in the right position, not upside down. Mm. Otherwise, uh, even where a drop can be caught mm. and preserved by, in a cup, mm. a whole gallon of water can be wasted on a cup that's upside down. Mm. Right now, um, uh, just, uh, just at least uh, re-answering your question. Uh, I think people think that oh, reading's the only thing that needs to be done. Looking at my messages on my smartphone is not reading in my eyes. Yeah. Reading means to have a disciplined insight into something. Right. Now, if you, if if anybody were to read this book, mm. I can safely say that that person if can see what mm. life was like in the early 1800s. Okay, I have a question for you now. <coughs> uh, have the, the short answer, of course, we're nearly coming to the end of the program. <laughs> uh, but, you know, for reading, again, we're, we're talking about something that the characters dealt with so much, yeah. patience. Mm -hmm. Things are available on a screen, and, you know, with one touch, one swipe of the finger, you're onto another page, and you're onto that. To tame ourselves again, and to say, okay, slow down, pick up that book, and just disconnect. What advice do you give to people? I think uh, I would, uh, the, ad the only advice I could give them is for them to ask themselves, what exactly did they gain by being so quick? Oh, that's a good question. And just ask them to uh, uh, repeat the fifth last point mm. that they can remember mm. of what they swiped mm. away or swiped into. Just mm. repeat the fifth last point, which should sensitize them to, look, I'm just flipping through images. Yeah. Ver verbal and uh, f photograph images, mm. but I'm not really gaining any knowledge. Because mm. when I read a book, I can see the society for what it was. Then I'll mm. read a history book, then I can correlate, oh, this is what was going on. Mm. So it helps me. Uh, I mean, I learned something. Mm. You can't force people to learn, but there are many people who want to learn. Yeah. They just have been caught up in this vortex of ele electronic media. Yeah which is not making them read. Honestly, they're not reading. Mm. They're just flipping through images. Mm. So I, I repeat what I just said, that uh, for, for somebody who wants to be sensitized, mm. just ask them, what was the fifth last point that you just read? Mm. They won't be able to tell you because, they don't, because it just came in the short memory and it's gone. The so retaining isn't happening. Real reading is it goes into your mind. Right. It imprints in the back of your mind. Mm. And, and then the patience element as well. How can a person Absolutely. work on their patience? Absolutely. I was a very impatient person. And when I was 18 years old, I picked up Bram Stoker's Dracula mm. to read it mm. because I wanted to develop patience. Okay. And, and I remember it hurt my head so much that I was like, no, I need something much harsher than this. That's mm. when I got into Dostoevsky. Mm. So I read my first Dostoevsky at the age of 18. So I learned Huge patience. Yeah. And, and it, it helped me. So if we want to learn something, this is the way it is. That's I fantastic. <laughs> that, that's a fantastic message uh, for the viewers as well. And, you know, thank you so much for thank himself for coming in me. today. And such an interesting book and such a wonderful subject, you know, for people, for all those people who would want to read, uh, they now are inspired I and motivated so. I hope so. to pick up <laughs> this book. <laughs> I hope so. No, and thank you for having me. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a, a book very close to my heart. And thank you for discussing it. Thank you once again. Okay, and with that, we come to the end of today's program. So many things we've been speaking about, human nature, that beast within. How are we going to tame all those emotions? And the person who is really successful in life is a person who is in control. So until next week, stay happy. Bye-bye.